Hello and welcome to OncLive News Network. I'm Laura Jones with Inside Oncology. In upcoming news, we'll be covering FDA-related stories on new biologics for hematologic malignancies and news from the ASTRO annual meeting. Also coming up, have researchers found the key to overcoming resistance in ALL? Next up, we'll hear about the attempt trial comparing TDM1 with the combination of paclitaxel and trastuzumab for stage 1 HER2 positive breast cancer. All this and more coming up on OncLive News Network. In the news, Amgen announced that it had submitted an application to the FDA for the bispecific T-cell engager antibody blenitumumab as a treatment for adult patients with Philadelphia negative relapsed or refractory ALL. The application and breakthrough therapy designation earlier this year were based on data from a phase two study in which 43% of patients, even those who were previously treated, experienced a complete remission or a complete remission with partial hematologic recovery. Median relapse-free survival and overall survival were about six months. 80% of responses occurred following the first cycle of therapy. In other FDA-related news, the agency and TG Therapeutics agreed upon a special protocol assessment for a Phase three clinical trial exploring the CD20 inhibitor ublituximab in combination with ibrutinib for treatment of patients with CLL. The FDA will allow the use of overall response as an endpoint for the biologics license application with long-term follow-up required for a full approval. In an earlier Phase II study, the objective response rate was 86% with this drug combination in CLL patients. The full analysis from this study will be presented at ASH in December. In news from the ASTRO meeting, a study showed that chemoradiotherapy can effectively downstage patients with borderline resectable or locally advanced pancreatic cancer so that they can undergo curative surgery. In the phase two study, approximately 40% of patients who were treated with chemotherapy and stereotactic ablative radiotherapy were then able to undergo surgery. Of these patients, 90% had no evidence of the disease following a Whipple procedure. In other news from ASTRO, aggressive treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer may improve outcomes. Three factors, the timing of metastatic development, lymph node involvement, and disease type were shown to impact survival in patients with stage four disease. There is hope these factors could offer a potential risk stratification scheme for ablative therapy. The study looked at 757 patients and found that aggressively treating low-risk patients with surgery or stereotactic ablative radiotherapy produced ideal outcomes. The survival rate in low-risk patients was 48%. In intermediate-risk patients, it was 36%. And in high-risk, it was 14%. However, a cautionary note, only patients who received radiotherapy were analyzed. Typically, those are patients who would respond well regardless. Also in the news, it appears that timing is everything when it comes to preventing resistance in ALL. In an analysis that was presented at a special AACR conference, cell lines treated with frontline disotinib followed by a single dose escalation demonstrated heightened sensitivity to crizotinib and foretinib. However, continued dose escalations of disotinib canceled this additive sensitivity to second-line agents. This suggests that there are distinct time points when second-line treatments might be more effective. In a similar experiment, crizotinib, which is not currently approved for ALL, demonstrated a similar efficacy to disotinib. Notably, crizotinib was found to be effective in BCR-ABLE T315I mutated cell lines, suggesting a possible new therapy for these patients. The ATTEMPT trial is a phase two study designed to evaluate disease-free survival with TDM1 compared with paclitaxel plus trastuzumab in women with HER2 positive early breast cancer. 
Next up, investigators from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute will talk about the study. Here at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, investigators are leading over 700 clinical trials across a variety of settings, including over 60 focused on breast cancer. One such study is comparing the antibody drug conjugate trastuzumab emtanzine, or TDM1, with paclitaxel and trastuzumab. Principal investigator Dr. Sarah Tolaney met with us to discuss this study. Attempt trial is a trial that's a randomized trial comparing trastuzumab DM1 to paclitaxel and trastuzumab. It's for patients who have stage 1 HER2 positive breast cancer. And, and for those patients, they're randomized in a 3 to 1 fashion, either to the TDM1 or to the paclitaxel and trastuzumab. So they receive, if they get randomized to the TDM1 arm, they get TDM1 every three weeks for a year. And then on that paclitaxel and trastuzumab arm, they get 12 weeks of paclitaxel and trastuzumab followed by nine months of trastuzumab monotherapy. The ATTEMPT trial hopes to build on the recent APT study, which examined adjuvant paclitaxel plus trastuzumab. This study demonstrated promising results. However, researchers believe that TDM1 alone could be superior. For further insight, we interviewed one of the APT study authors, Dr. Harold Burstein, about the study that set the groundwork for the ATTEMPT trial. We know that women who have small HER2-positive breast cancers have a generally good prognosis, but because of HER2 overexpression, they can be somewhat riskier than you might imagine, even though the tumor is very small. And so as a way of coming up with a suitable regimen for these women, our group led a study we called the APT study, the Adjuvant Paclitaxel Trastuzumab study, where we took about 400 women at our center and many centers around the country who participated in this trial with us and treated them with 12 weeks of paclitaxel plus trastuzumab followed by a year of maintenance trastuzumab. These patients all had very small HER2-positive breast cancers. But what was important was we showed that there was an outstanding result. There was really only a 2 to 3 percent risk of cancer recurrence through four or five years of follow-up, which we thought was very good, and this is a reasonably well-tolerated regimen. The ATTEMPT trial hopes to show that TDM1 is less toxic than the paclitaxel-trastuzumab combination while demonstrating an advantage in terms of disease-free survival. There are two co-primary endpoints. One of them is to compare the toxicity between the two arms, and with our hypothesis being that the TDM1 arm may be better tolerated than the paclitaxel trastuzumab arm. And another endpoint is to look at the disease-free survival within the TDM1 arm itself. Yeah, so we had done a prior trial called the APT trial that had looked at the paclitaxel trastuzumab combination in a very similar patient population and found that patients did extremely well with that regimen. The three-year disease-free survival was 98.7%. So we felt that we may want to try to find an agent that may be even better tolerated for this low-risk population, and we thought TDM1 seemed like an attractive drug, and which in the metastatic setting, there's a trial suggesting it may be slightly more efficacious than paclitaxel and trastuzumab. So that's why we designed this trial, which is sort of a follow-up study to the APT trial, really, to compare the toxicity between the two drugs. What's exciting about TDM1 is it's the same antibody as trastuzumab that targets the HER2 protein, but they have linked to the antibody the actual chemotherapy moiety. And so it's like you use the antibody to sort of deliver the chemotherapy like a smart bomb right to the tumor. And the beautiful thing about it from the patient's point of view is it does not have many of the typical chemotherapy side effects. It doesn't make your hair fall out. It doesn't make your blood counts get low. It doesn't give you neuropathy or tingling in the hands and the feet. So it's a very well to tolerated product. And so the study is designed to show that these results will be as good with TDM1 as they were with paclitaxel trastuzumab and hopefully show that it's an even better tolerated regimen. This study is currently enrolling patients at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute with an estimated enrollment of 500 patients. Patients need to have stage 1 HER2 positive disease, so they need to have tumors that are under 2 centimeters. They are allowed to have one micrometastasis in one lymph node, and they have to have good cardiac function, so they need to have an ejection fraction over 50%. And we do require central confirmation of the HER2 status, and so all tumor gets sent to a central lab for HER2 testing, and sometimes that does cause a slight delay because it takes seven to 10 days for a turnaround before patients can enroll. 
Patients with excessive alcohol intake, defined as three or more beverages per day, will be excluded from the study, based on early reports of potential liver toxicity. There has been some reports of TDM1 liver toxicity, so we want to make sure that patients who are on study aren't patients who are drinking lots of alcohol. This was actually something that was mandated by the FDA for this particular trial. We are very excited to have Dr. Patrick Borgen from Mimodities Medical Center joining us today. Dr. Borgen is chair of the Department of Surgery and heads the Brooklyn Breast Cancer Center. He is also the program chair of the PER Miami Breast Cancer Conference. He has received a multitude of grants from the National Institutes of Health, the American Cancer Society, the U.S. Army and National Cancer Institute. Additionally, he has published over 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals, 139 abstracts, and 15 editorials. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you Borgen, for, having me. for joining I'm very us. Very excited to be here. Thank well, you. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the clinical research uh, that you're engaged in right now? Sure. Um, in the late 80s, I trained uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, I spent two years in the breast cancer research lab there. Uh, I joined their faculty in 1991. In 93, I became the chief breast surgeon at Memorial and spent the next 12 or 13 years running that uh, program. I also founded the William F. Keck Breast Cancer Research Laboratory at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, after a wonderful 15-year run there, I was recruited to help build Brooklyn's first and only cancer center and first and only breast cancer center. Well, why don't you talk a little bit about some of your current clinical interests? Right, so um, everything breast cancer related uh, fascinates me. Uh, we participated in the discovery of the BRCA2 mutation that Ashkenazi Jewish women uh, suffer from. Uh, we were developers of sentinel node biopsy technology, skin sparing, nipple sparing mastectomy. Today we're involved in efforts of prevention, uh, continuing to fine-tune the treatment of breast cancer. Well, you I mentioned something there, and there has been a lot of discussion uh, about widespread screening for the BRCA mutations, uh, particularly in women of the Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So what is your opinion about population-based BRCA screening yeah. and some of the most recent uh, recommendations suggested by researcher Mary Claire King? Yeah. Well, Mary Claire King is a very dear friend and has been a collaborator for 20 years, and I respect her enormously. Recently, she started a dialogue about whether we should screen women in the Ashkenazi population, regardless of family history, for the BRCA gene. And her logic is that one in 50, two mm percent -hmm. of women that are Ashkenazi have this mutation. That's a very high percentage, actually. And so her theory is, is that gene testing is where mammography used to be. It used to be that you felt a lump, you right. went to your doctor, and then you got a mammogram. Mm -hmm. And of course today we screen with mammograms before. Mary Claire is saying, we're learning about BRCA mutations too late. So her editorial about this has raised a lot of eyebrows, but it's a great dialogue to have. It's, it's the right question to be asking. So it's a matter of, at a certain age, looking at genetics. Uh, and, and is there a certain age that it, it, uh, women would go to to say, do I have this? Well, it's really about risk management. Mm. The BRCA genes code for both breast cancer and ovarian cancer. We have great screening for breast cancer. We have no screening for ovarian cancer. So the idea here is to identify women who are at a 20 to 30 percent risk of getting ovarian cancer and, and helping them interact proactively. Well, what about the ethics and the efficacy of a prophylactic double mastectomy for breast cancer prevention? Um, does it make a difference overall? A recent study showed that it really doesn't change the survival rate. And the reason for that is that a woman who's at high risk, who's being followed so closely, who's having mammograms and maybe MRIs of the breast, the cure rate for those women is about 96 or 97 percent. And so therefore removing the breast tissue changes a very small risk of dying of breast cancer. But that's not why women choose the option. It's to avoid the anxiety, the countless biopsies, the worry, living from mammogram to mammogram, from MRI to MRI, to avoid the eventuality of breast cancer treatment. 
And so the studies have been interpreted as saying, this operation is unnecessary. I completely disagree, that's, that's not correct. And high-risk women sitting in front of us would yell and scream, wait a minute, I have a right not to go through breast cancer. I have a right to remove it from my plate. That's really what the debate is about. And it's not 100% effective, but it lowers it a well, very significant. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, again, the critics of the operation have said that, but the numbers are stunning. The average U.S. woman who lives to be 80 mm -hmm. has a 10% chance of getting breast cancer. These women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 have a 70, 80, 90% chance. The operation reduces the risk to 1% or less. Mm. So some people have chosen to refer to this as a risk-reducing mastectomy. I'm fine with that. The reduction is profound. All right, so the whole mammography debate, it, it's never ending. So can you talk <laughs> about the benefits of early detection uh, uh, versus the risk of over-diagnosing, over-treatment over associated with the current mammography screening recommendations? The American Cancer Society and, and other groups have really identified 40 as the, as the start point for mammography. So the short answer is mammograms save lives. Um, the fact that there is any debate at all is based on a number of deeply flawed studies that muddied the water a bit. And so when you eliminate the confounded studies, the data is clear. Um, women who participate in mammographic screening have a 30 to 40 percent less chance of dying of breast cancer than women who don't have screening. And again, that's only half of the story. Women who participate in mammographic screening need less surgery. They need less radiation. They need less chemotherapy. And so the fact that there is a debate about this still to this day uh, is a head scratcher for me. I just can't. I can't understand it. Well, and you as a doctor, um, you know, how do you how do you rectify that? There are patients out there, doctors out there, who have options, and um, it's wonderful that there are so many options. But is it to a certain degree, gosh, too many options? And again, the risk of of over treating. Is there a downside to over treating? Well, the the answer short answer is yes. Um, if, if I have a woman who's 85 years old and she has a heart condition and she has diabetes and she's sort of struggling day to day, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to get a mammogram, uh, find a breast cancer that is never going to threaten her health. The real debate in overtreatment has to do with a condition called DCIS, duct carcinoma in situ. And this is where a lot of research is focused right now. The incidence of DCIS, this is a, a pre-invasive or a non-invasive type of breast cancer. So it's breast cancer that's trapped within a milk duct. The growth in the number of cases per year paralleled the growth of mammography, the popularization of mammography. When we look at autopsy series of women who die of other diseases, a lot of them have DCIS. And so there is a subset, there's a pool of DCIS patients, where that disease was never going to progress and threaten the woman. That's true over diagnosis and over treatment. We don't really have tools yet to identify the good DCIS from the bad DCIS, but we will. There's no question that we will. So that's been the heart of the debate is for DCIS, are we over treating it? And the answer is we are but we need better tools. And you're so involved with uh, clinical interest. I mean, what else is up and coming on the horizon? I mean, back in the 90s uh, and looking to today, how many changes, how many more options there are out yeah. there? Uh, what can we expect in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, it's, it's been a stunning ride for me. I started my practice in 1990. Um, we had one or two options surgically. We had one option medical oncology. We had one option. The, the fundamental theme is that breast cancer is not a single disease. It's a family of diseases, and it's a complicated family. And, and the goal here is to match the treatment with the disease that the patient has. It's what we do with infectious diseases. We do a culture and sensitivity, and we see what the bacteria respond to, and we give them just that one drug. We don't give them six antibiotics and hope one of them works. And so this is what's been called personalized medicine. Uh, I like that term. 
Uh, and so that's where all of the progress is right now and where all the excitement is. Right, right. Are there any other thoughts that you'd like to add or any advice for doctors out there who may be watching, patients out there who are, you know, struggling with trying to find the right doctor or the right answer or doctors like you who are saying, I, I don't get where the debate is? Yeah. Well, I think that I, I would have two messages. One would be screening matters. Um, in a world of really good surgery and good medicine and good radiation, early detection is still our best weapon. Women who have stage one breast cancer do a lot better than women with stage two or stage three. So hopefully through vehicles like the Miami Breast Conference, we can shed light on the controversies about screening and eventually put them to rest. The second thing is, is that breast cancer is complicated. It's really about a team. And so the patient needs to find not the doctor, but the team to work with. You need surgery and medical oncology and radiation and pathology and radiology and genetics, all looking at your case from different perspectives so that the, the approach is a comprehensive approach. Um, so that's really what the patient's looking for. Is that happening in the medical community? Are all of these disciplines looking because they are coming at it from different angles? Are they all working together? Or are you finding that it's difficult to get that communication together? I think that we're headed in the right direction. Um, doctors are busy. Breast is a high volume business. We see a lot of patients. So that there is an accreditation program through the American College of Surgeons which is called NAPBC, the National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers. What they mandate is for you to get accredited, for you to get the good housekeeping seal of approval, you really have to present most, if not all, of your patients' cases to this group. So we do that in Brooklyn routinely. We spend about three hours every Tuesday going over every single patient with the entire team. I think that's good medicine. I think it's good for our patients. Um, so I think there's a national trend towards doing that. It really should be the standard of care. Doctor, say you have a patient come in and she's concerned because she's high risk. From a surgeon's perspective, uh, what are the best practices that should be followed? I think that surgeons need to carve out a little more time for the patient who comes in based on the Jolie effect, who says, my grandmother had breast cancer, my aunt had breast cancer. I think that there's a lot of history that the surgeon needs to take. The father's side matters. We need to understand about both mother and father's side. All of the genes, and I mean all of them, that have to do with breast cancer are not on sex chromosomes. They're autosomal. And so the father's side matters as much as the mother's side. So the surgeon needs to take a really complete history. And then, in general terms, talk about what the patient's goals are. Because if testing for a gene, testing for BRCA, would in no way change the patient's life or her pathway, then it might not make sense. But if the patient has daughters or sisters or her own feeling is to be proactive, then I think the surgeon should facilitate that referral to a geneticist. And this is really kind of getting into personalized medicine and there's so much a patient needs to do. They need to do their due diligence before going in and not just show up once a year for their mammogram or once every however many years for their mammogram. Yeah, it's really true and it's particularly true for the woman who's had a family history and now has a problem. She now has breast cancer. Uh, the writer Martha Lear wrote, that breast cancer was the only disease in which a woman could be threatened by the lump in her neighbor's breast. And it really is true. Um, everybody knows someone with breast cancer. The problem is, is that when women get the diagnosis, their first reaction might be, remove both breasts, remove my ovaries, remove my adrenal glands, I'm done. We've got to slow them down in that regard because that's not something they're likely to pursue if we just slow the presses down, we reassure them. So that initial reaction about doing a double mastectomy is common and I think can be very, very harmful. Once they have the diagnosis, there's a huge amount of information that patients need to have at their fingertips. For example, genomic profiling. For the first half of my career, every woman with breast cancer got chemotherapy small tumors, negative nodes. That was the standard in this country. And it was based on randomized trials. In those days, we treated 100 women, 
to help four. So 96 women got chemotherapy with early stage breast cancer with no hope of that helping them. Today we have genomic profiling platforms like Oncotype DX, like Mammaprint, that will allow us to put cancers into boxes. If you look at the patients with estrogen receptor positive, HER2 new negative, node negative breast cancer, we can re remove chemotherapy from more than half of those patients using Oncotype DX. It's simply not going to help them. So that's what patients need to be aware of, is that there are options out there to personalize their care. And what about some of the advances in surgery, in the actual surgery? So everyone knows about laparoscopic surgery. My uncle had his gallbladder out with these scopes and he went home the next day. So breast surgery is going through the same evolution. We're doing surgery through tiny little incisions, using fiber optic retractors. We're sparing not only the skin of the breast, but the skin of the nipple uh, most of the time now. This has huge psychological benefits to the patient, and frankly, it also increases the amount of sensation in the skin of the breast after mastectomy. Implants are better than they've ever been. Breast implants are actually shaped like breasts now. They used to be shaped like jellyfish, mm -hmm. and today we have custom-made, custom-shaped implants. All of the techniques are better, and the, that means that as we cure 95, 96, hopefully 100% of patients, we've, we've minimized the, the, the cosmetic blow. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the trials. And at one point, it would take up to 15 years right. uh, to get answers. And now there are new procedures that have shaved upwards of 12 years off of that. Yeah, uh, so that? Uh, in, in my generation, early on, we would do a trial, and then we would wait 10 years to see what happened. We don't have the time, the money, or the patience to do that anymore. So with medicines becoming as effective as they are, and they're really effective, we're seeing something called a PCR, a complete pathologic response. PCR is? That means that in someone with a known breast cancer, who we do chemotherapy, for example, first, and then we test the breast, the cancer's gone. It's simply melted away with the chemo and that's called a complete pathologic response. That is now a valid endpoint for clinical trials, which means that if we're doing a trial of drug A and the patients have a complete pathologic response, we're done. We don't have to wait 10 years for those results. This has been an enormous advantage for us in, in, in drug development, in trial development, and it's gonna help women much quicker. What about the uh, chances of recurrence? If you have a lump and you, you know, are ha able to have it removed with the minimal invasive and you know minimal uh, amount of, of treatment afterwards, uh, wh what's the recurrence? Well, breast cancers are like my family. You have good guy family members and bad guy family members and members in jail, and so um, <laughs> uh, looking down a microscope. If you look at a family portrait of my family, you can't really tell who the good guys and the bad guys are. We've been doing that with breast cancer for 50 years. We look down a microscope and we see breast cancer cells, and we try to make a guess about their personality. Those days are over. That's a, that's a descriptive understanding of the disease. A pathologist says, I think this is a good guy. We're now developing ways to have a functional understanding by doing gene profiling. Wow. So a platform like Oncotype DX that looks at 21 genes tells us with great detail about the personality of the breast cancer that's in front of us. And so that patient that you mentioned with an, what appears to be a small early stage negative lymph node breast cancer may or may not be. So. So that brings up the importance of personalizing medicine, of genomic profiling, of getting all of the information. Phase two data, it was just recently presented by Dr. Elizabeth Mittendorf, and it shows a reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence associated with the novel HER2-derived peptide vaccine, GP2. Um, can you talk about these sure. findings and its implications? So the premise here is that for us to beat cancer, our immune system has to play a role. So your body's own immune defenses have to play a role in the fight against your cancer. 
We learned this during the HIV AIDS crisis where patients with this terrible disease were dying of breast cancer and other cancers, Kaposi sarcoma, lymphomas, leukemias, despite our best treatments because their own immune systems were not able to join the fight. So the whole, one of the holy grails in breast cancer has been how do we turn on a woman's immune system against her own breast cancer? So what Dr. Mittendorf and her group at MD Anderson have done is they've created a vaccine against the HER2 new oncoprotein uh, that has been marvelously successful. So in a group of patients who received conventional treatment plus a drug called trastuzumab, which is an anti-HER2 drug, they randomized patients to either get a drug that stimulates the immune system or a drug that stimulates the immune system plus their vaccine. In the group of high HER2 new positive patients who got this vaccine, they had zero recurrences, none. Wow, that's amazing. So this is really unbelievably exciting. Uh, previous attempts at using the Im immune system have not been particularly successful. Uh, we had 13 years of study at Memorial looking at different vaccines. Uh, so Dr. Mittendorf and her group have really hit it out of the ballpark with this, and it, it, it moves immunotherapy into the prime time in a, in a big way. And this immunotherapy applies to women who have, are at high risk or who have already gone through the process, not just right. an overall, let's vaccinate all, all women over 40. Right. Um, it's, it's a necessary step along the pathway to what you're talking about. The, the dream would be to give someone a vaccine, uh, HPV vaccine, and reduce the chance of cervical cancer. That's a great example. Um, the problem with vaccinating against breast cancer is there are 50 or 100 different types. And so that has been the limitation of this. Now, Dr. Mittendorf's study is proof of principle that it is possible to do it. Um, about 25% of women who get breast cancer have HER2 new positive breast cancer. So even if we were able to get rid of 25% of the 200,000 new cases, that would be an amazing advance. Right. Right. So patients really, they just need to stay on top of the research, ask a lot of questions, and doctors too, yeah. continue to, to reach out and, and communicate with, with one another about right. women, the options available. Women do a really good job of networking. Men don't. It's sort of the <laughs> men don't ask directions problem, which I suffer from. Um, women, uh, we did a study that showed that women talk to, on average, 20 people about their diagnosis. Men talk to two, their wife and their boss. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so this research that women do is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, who, who treated who? What was their experience? Mm -hmm. How are they doing? The internet is a dangerous place yes. to do research because there's no filter. It's, it's information, but it's not knowledge. And so getting second opinions, we always encourage second opinions in Brooklyn. Um, really doing your homework, talking to people. I think the hardest thing is convincing women to slow down. You know, I've got this on Thursday, I want surgery Friday. And that makes sense, I totally get that. But most breast cancers that we find have been there for five or six years mm -hmm. by the time they're diagnosed. Even the smaller lumps. Yeah, they start at a single cell, mm -hmm. and if you do two to four to eight to 16, mm -hmm. it just takes years mm -hmm. to be able to see a breast cancer on a mammogram. Mm -hmm. So taking that week or those two weeks or even three weeks to wind up at a place that's gonna give you the best chance of a cure is time well spent. All right, doctor, thank you so much thank for joining much. us. So good My to have pleasure. you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Onc Live News Network. I'm Laura Jones. We'll see you next time.